What was the first transistor radio made by Magnavox? If you guessed this one, you'd be right. See, that was easy. It's the six-transistor Magnavox AM2, and it is from 1956, or maybe even as early as 1955. In what we call a horizontal co-pocket configuration, this is a good-looking radio. We're going to look at two of these today, this red one, which is a little bit later in the production run of this model, and this white one, which is one of the earliest ones produced. You'll notice some differences between the two in the tuning knob and at the bottom of the front, the way the Magnavox name is applied. Also, on the earlier model, the words All Transistor appear on a separate metal plate. Magnavox has a long history, going back to the Commercial Wireless and Development Company, founded in 1911 in Napa, California. Napa Valley, you may know, from the wines made there. Anyway, the founders sobered up enough to move to San Francisco a little while later, then settled in nearby Oakland in 1916. They found success with their invention of a kind of moving coil loudspeaker, which I think you can best describe today as a kind of an earphone with a horn attached to it. The horn acoustically amplifies the sound. Before such horns, all radio listening was done with headphones. So since commercial wireless and development was in the business of making things louder, they decided to change their name to Big Voice, which would have been a pretty crummy name if they hadn't had the good sense to translate it to Latin, where Big Voice comes out Magna Vox. Magna Vox. Like the Region CTR-1 and most of the rest of the first American transistor radios, this one has no vents on the back. I don't know why they didn't think they needed them, or why they soon thereafter decided they did need them on later models. Opening it up, we see the label, on which is illustrated a diagram of the parts layout. There's mention there of the civil defense frequencies, and a list of suitable 4-volt batteries to power the set. Then we get a list of things not to do, like setting your radio on top of a heater. And it says here that the Magnavox company is now in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Magnavox covers the chassis with a piece of fiberboard inside the back. And here's another difference between the early and later models. You can see on the earlier one that this chassis covering is plastic rather than fiberboard. We are reminded how new the printed circuit was in electronics at the time. We are reminded of this because there isn't one. This radio is wired, probably by hand, the old-fashioned way, called point-to-point -point wiring. No printed circuit board. Only the earliest transistor radios were made this way, and not many of those. For example, the first Zenith pocket transistor radio, the Royal 500, had point-to-point -point wiring, but by the following year, the newer versions of the Royal 500 had a printed circuit board. And indeed, this AM2 model from Magnavox was followed by an almost identical-looking AM5 model, which had a printed circuit board. Here's an ad for the Magnavox AM2. You'll notice that the illustration of the radio in the ad shows the earliest version. This ad appeared in Holiday Magazine in July of 1956 and would be the first, or at least one of the first generation of ads, introducing this first, for Magnavox, a transistor radio. The same early version AM2 is shown on the owner's manual. I'll give you some quiet for a moment to let you look over both sides of this owner's manual in peace. I'm sure there are also some circuitry differences between the earlier and later versions of this radio. But you know, I think you can probably say that about any and all transistor radios ever made. And here's the nice leather case that came with the AM2. It's full-grain saddle leather, 
but since it's a 70-year-old piece of leather at this point, I'm not going to go bending it around. It has a nice soft finish on the inside and doesn't scratch the radio much. In the bottom of this case is another compartment for an earphone or maybe an extra battery. What will they think of next? Well, I'm thinking this might just pull right off of here if I try to open it, so no. We will just leave what's in here, if anything, to our imaginations. And what is this? It's the Sentinel IE500, and it is a rare one. Sentinel was an old radio manufacturer out of Evanston, Illinois, near Chicago. Their main business was making radios for other private label brands. Today, I think we would call Sentinel an OEM. I suppose it is an irony that this transistor radio, their only transistor radio, would be made not by them, for someone else, but for them, by Magnavox. It is essentially a Magnavox AM2 that is branded Sentinel. Who made what is an assumption we are making here, based on who survived. It's conceivable that it was Sentinel who made both Sentinel and Magnavox transistor radios, but we assume Magnavox was the maker because, as it turned out, Magnavox acquired Sentinel in 1956, and it is the winners who write the history. The tale is always told from the perspective of the survivor. I like that little rectangle on the bottom left of the front of the AM2. Its function is purely decorative, but I like how it matches the tuning knob. And I like that dial, especially on the early ones. The Magnavox AM2. Clean, simple lines and flat, or nearly so, on all sides. A quality look for a quality radio. Oh, and the on-off indicator is a nice piece of work. There's a ring of red paint on the volume knob inside this radio that shows through the little window when the radio is turned on. This is so you can tell at a glance if the radio's on and don't accidentally leave it on at low volume or with weak batteries. This kind of an indicator is low-tech genius. <laughs>